Okay, up there. Good. Okay, so we, can't, we talk about stability analysis, and I'm going to give you, um, let's say, a quick rundown or uh, an, an overview of the tools of stability. Uh, and I deliberately threw in that modern, uh, that, that, that adjective modern. It's a little bit daring because it could be not more than, you know, a year from now. But nevertheless, I'm trying to somehow uh, connect what you might know from a fluids course or a hydrodynamic stability course and connect that one to the complexity of things that we have to actually deal with in terms of stability theory. Okay. But uh, to start out with, um, let me just, uh, give you a few, a little bit of a, of a, of a motivation before I hit you uh, with, with some equations. So fluid instabilities, it's a, it's a, a stability theory is a central discipline of, of, of fluid mechanics, you know, just open JFM and so there's always a stability analysis somewhere in every issue. So fluid instabilities are all around us. Everywhere you look, there's a, you can see a fluid instability. Uh, they appear on all spatial and temporal scales. Okay, from the small one, microfluidics, all the way to the atmospheric sciences and uh, oceanography or astrophysical applications. And they're caused by a multitude of phenomena. Okay, I'm going to show you a few examples on the next slides. And they also have a great impact on technologies and environment. We do have to care about instabilities because they really limit an operational range of a fluid device or some, uh, you know, they are responsible for safety margins of certain uh, certain devices and so on. Okay, so here are just a bunch of examples of fluid instabilities, and I'm going to write down what the, sort of the main component of that one is. So the most common ones are probably uh, shear-induced instabilities. So we have the UDY, which causes um, a positive feedback in the flow that creates some patterns. For example, that Kelmold's in, uh, Kelmold, Kelvin Helmholtz instability of that lenticular cloud hanging over a mountain. A little bit more from a simulation. This is the uh, Rayleigh shear instabilities of a rotating disk. Uh, we're sitting on an instability as we speak. So this is a thermally driven instability of the core mantle, con uh, the earth mantle convection. Okay, so this is a stability instability going on all the time in the core of the of the of the earth. So this would be the same one for a laboratory experiment. Rayleigh Binar convection, a very famous one with the hexagonal patterns. That's an instability that is thermally induced. Okay, interfacial instability is the breakup, very classical one of a capillary jet into little drops. That one can be written as an instability of a columnar, a columnar jet. Okay, and then you can push that one quite far. You know, two colliding jets make this fishbone instability uh, that is also interfacial in nature. Okay. Free surface instabilities, this is a capillary wave propagation. That one is an instability on the free surface waves. And you can even go to non-traditional fluid applications and do the sand dune ripple formation and, and uh, describe that one as an instability on the sand dune. Okay. Then uh, we also have uh, magnetically driven instability. In that case, the magnetic field is the main player in that instability. So this is a ferrofluid, which has surface instabilities. You put a magnet underneath. It's very popular in uh, science museums to, for kids to play with. Uh, but on a more larger scale, this is a MHD instability of a tokamak plasma. Okay, and then actually these instabilities, there's plenty of them, and they're very, very tough to, to, uh, to, uh, to control. Uh, the instabilities, the magnetically induced instabilities in that MHD tokamak plasma is probably the main reason why we do not have uh, nuclear fusion at the moment. Okay, just getting those uh, in check is, is, the, is the main challenge, among many others, but it's one of the main challenges. Okay. This is a buoyancy-driven instability. This is lock exchange flow. You have two different fluids. The heavy one goes underneath the light one and then creates these HOMBO instabilities for a lock exchange flow. And you can also scale that one up from a lab experiment. This is a, this is a, a, a picture of Lake Geneva, and there is a buoyancy instability there that is responsible for nutrient transport in, uh, in Lake Geneva. If you go really high up in, uh, in Reynolds numbers, then you can also have rotationally driven instabilities. The spiral galaxy and accretion disks are just full of instabilities. Uh, the spiral arms that are forming are manifestations of a rotational instability. 
And for example, the, the spot, the red spot on Jupiter is uh, certainly an instability. Uh, also, morphological instabilities, that's not what we really think about an instability, but if you have a gradient in some kind of a chemical uh, concentration, in that case it's calcium, uh, you got actually the formation of stalagmites and stalactites in, in caves is a very slow instability, but nevertheless it's a morphological instability. Okay? Same thing goes for uh, the thing that's called penitentes. These are uh, ice ice sculptures, so to speak, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, Andes. Uh, they're about two meters high. You can walk in between them if you dare to do so. And there, that's a radiative sublimation instability that actually forms the, the, the penitentus and sets the scales in the spatial directions. And finally, you know, combustion instability in that case, of course, it's reactive flow. You have all kind of uh, instabilities on that one. All right, so before we talk about uh, stability, let me also introduce the stability concepts because stability has been around for a long time. It has been treated mathematically, not just by the fluid dynamicists. So uh, what do we usually understand or, or how do we define stability, okay? So the definition of stability is usually given in a context of a dynamical system. We have x dot is equal to f of x, f is nonlinear, and then we have some kind of an equilibrium point. That could be an exact equilibrium point or a quasi-equilibrium point. Okay? And then we're going to follow a small perturbation about this equilibrium state. So we're going to zoom in onto this equilibrium state and see what happens if we deviate just a little bit from it. And then the classical pictures in the, all the physics textbooks is like this. Okay? So we have a bowl like this. You displace it here. The bottom is an equilibrium point. If you displace that one, it rolls down the bowl and returns to its, its equilibrium. It's stable. If it's unstable, it rolls off and it's indifferent or neutrally stable if you can just push it back and forth and it stays there. Okay, so this is a little bit of an intuitive way of describing the stability of an equilibrium point. The person that somehow first mathematized the whole concept is uh, Lapunov. Okay, he also started out with a dynamical system, x dot is f of x of t, with an equilibrium point, just like before. And then he wrote a paper in 1892 uh, that, uh, that suggested two stability concepts. Okay, so there's Lapunov 1 and there's Lapunov 2, both in the same paper. And Lapunov 1, this is the mathematical definition, says if we start out somewhere a delta away from the, from the, from the equilibrium point, we're going to stay in an epsilon for all times. Okay? That's the definition of stability. We're not, we're not moving away. We could move away, but we're not really shooting off very far. Okay? So you have a delta neighborhood and an epsilon neighborhood. This is where you start out. This is where you end up in the worst possible case. Okay? That one is called Lapunov stable. The second one is if we return for time to infinity, we return to the equilibrium point eventually. So in that case, that epsilon is going to zero. We're actually returning back. Okay, it's a special case. Then we're saying we're asymptotically stable. Okay? And that paper actually had a, quite an impact because it first formalized a stability concept on which you can actually build all kind of mathematical theories. Okay? But you should notice two, two, uh, one thing in both, in both definitions. Okay, this is for all t, and this is t to infinity. Okay, so for all t and t to infinity basically means there is no time scale in the stability definition. Okay, we, as long as this thing eventually returns back to the equilibrium state, we're going to consider it stable. Otherwise, it's unstable. Okay. So then, of course, this got picked up immediately. You know, it was a very successful paper. Nowadays, you would say it's highly cited. Okay? Uh, and it was translated for fluid systems. Okay? So we have an equilibrium state. That would be our base flow. Okay? That's our equilibrium state. And then we're going we're gonna to have a small perturbation around that one. So we go an epsilon away. And we just look at the dynamics of the perturbations Q. Okay. And for small epsilon, they're governed by the Jacobian. 
and the Jacobian are our linearized Navier-Stokes equations. If you want to modify them, uh, you can actually bring them into a, a nicer form, and then they're known as the Orsomophil equations. Okay, so we have an evolution equation for the Jacob uh, with the Jacobian as the system matrix. And then if you throw in the Lapunov stability concept, okay, that one is equivalent to saying, you know, I'm going to have e to the minus i omega t because I have exponential uh, instabilities. Okay? And then the whole thing turns into an eigenvalue problem for the stability of the system. Okay? Here's the eigenvalue problem. The ddt turns into an i omega. That's an eigenvalue problem. And then you just look at the imaginary part of omega here that makes it either exponentially grow or exponentially decay. Okay, so the eigenvalues of L are what tells you the stability, and that's exactly what we always do when we linearize uh, a dynamical system. Okay, now if you if you do that one, if you look at if you form your linearized Navier-Stokes equations and look at the eigenvalues, the largest growth. Let's just say a simple flow like channel flow. Okay. The law, and then you crank up the Reynolds number as high as you can. Eventually, this will go stable because it has no inflection point. So there has to be a Reynolds number where you get the maximum growth. Okay? And that Reynolds number is ridiculously high, first of all. It's in the, I believe it's in the 19,000s or something like that. Okay? And if you take the worst possible growth rate you can have there and stick that one in, it's a growth rate that is so small that you have to go 50 channel heights downstream for the amplitude to just double. Okay, so this is this is about as bad as it can get in the channel flow. Okay, so obviously this is not a very useful tool to analyze channel flow, and the trick for you know making it a little bit more realistic is we need to somehow reintroduce a time scale. We cannot have that t to infinity or for, for all time constraint on the, on the stability because the most flows that we, that we actually look at don't give a perturbation an infinite time horizon to do what they need to do. Things will change on a much, much faster time scale. Okay? So we have to reintroduce the time scale for a more general and a more realistic stability analysis. All right, so that brings me to the mathematical framework that allows us to do that in the most flexible way that we can imagine. Okay, so for that one, I'm going to take my fluid system. Okay, and I'm going to, I'm not going to throw too many equations at you. I just sort of symbolize the equations. Everybody has different equations, incompressible, compressible, multiphase, whatever you have. Okay, reactive flows. So this is my fluid system. Okay. And I treat it as an input-output system. So that means I somehow define the things I have control over. That's my input. And that could be an initial condition. It could be a forcing from the outside. It could be a roughness distribution. It could be the placement of a bump somewhere. It could be anything that you consider a control variable of the fluid system. Okay. Then it goes through the fluid system. The fluid system does what it does. And then on the output side, I measure something. And that something is just a number, a scalar. Okay? The drag, the dissipation, the Nusselt number, whatever you have. Okay? That's my output. So then, by learning more about the problem, I'm going to say, okay, I want to write this down as an optimization problem. I want to make this output, the drag, for example, as large or as small as I can by playing around with my control variable. Okay, so this turns into an uh, uh, objective uh, definition. So my my uh, my objective, which is a function of the state and my control, needs to be optimized, minimum or maximum. I don't really care about that. Okay, but I cannot just optimize into the blue. I have to also satisfy my governing equations. Okay, so this is the constraint. I have to be truthful to my Navier-Stokes equations, but within that constraint, I want to do as best as I can. Okay, and that one is a PDE constraint optimization. Now, constraint optimizations are notoriously hard to solve. 
Okay? What we usually do is we like to have one expression that we optimize rather than saying this is what we optimize, but we also have a second equation that needs to be, that needs to be satisfied. We want to lump the two together, and that one is done by adding our constraint, which is a full equation, okay, uh, with a Lagrange multiplier to combine these two things all together and then optimize it in one shot. Okay? So this is a standard trick to turn a constrained optimization into now an unconstrained optimization, where the constraint is just added with a Lagrange multiplier, and this Q plus is my Lagrange multiplier. That's the one that satisfies the constraint, or, or makes sure the constraint is, is taken into account. All right, so now this L, which is known as the augmented Lagrangian, Okay. Now depends on three variables, the Q, the U, and we introduced another variable, the Q plus. Okay? Three variables, and we have to optimize this expression. Okay? Now if you have a function with three variables, the way you do that to get the minimum or a maximum, you take the derivative with respect to all three variables and set each one zero. Now this works exactly the same way here. We take the first derivative, but since we're not taking a derivative with respect to an uh, uh, independent variable, we take it with respect to a function, we have to take variations, okay, but it's the same idea. So I take dl dq plus, dl dq and dl du, that's my three variables of L, and I set all of them to zero to satisfy the constraint that this has to be a minimum or a maximum, okay? And just like with functions, you get three expressions for these three, um, for these three uh, 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 conditions. Okay, so here is our, our uh, Lagrangian. Okay, and now out of this one come three equations. Now, if you have a function, you usually get algebraic equations. Okay? But because we're doing variations, in this case, we actually get equations, not just algebraic expressions. Okay. So, the first one is the simplest one. I have to differentiate L up here with respect to Q+. Plus. Well, Q plus only appears here. And if you differentiate with respect to Q+, plus, it, doesn't it doesn't appear anywhere else, and it happens to be linear. So, this whole thing acts just like a coefficient. Okay? So, taking the derivative with respect to Q+, plus is just this coefficient which is a function all by itself, and sure enough, it's the function that we had in the beginning. So nothing is learned at that moment. This is, this is just bringing back the governing equations and saying, you have to satisfy that. We knew that. Okay? Gets a little bit more complicated for the second one. So now we're doing the dl dq, and we see that q appears here, here as a time derivative, and here inside the f. Okay. So in that case, we have to do a little bit of more work. That one uses integration by parts, but it's not so bad. And then you get an equation that looks like this. Q plus dot dF dQ H Q plus dH dQ. So this is the part from differentiating the Q in here. That's the H component. That's the F component. And that one is the Q plus component from the multiplication of these two terms. Okay? So three equations, uh, uh, three terms in that equation. So we see that we get our original evolution equation back, but now we also get an equation for the Lagrange multiplier. That one has its own equation, and that thing is called the adjoint equation, okay? The adjoint equation, because the Lagrange multipliers are also known as the adjoint variables, okay? Final uh, derivative we have to take is the LDU is equal to zero, okay? Now, U appears here, twice here in H, and it also is inside the F, okay? Now, it is not anywhere contributing here. That's the only one that has time derivatives, okay? So no contribution from here. That's why this last equation will not be an evolution equation. It will be an algebraic equation, no time derivative, okay? And this is how it looks like. Okay, the HDU, which is the part from here, the FDU is the part from here multiplied by Q plus. 
That one is the optimality condition. So out of these, satisfying these three things together to get an optimum, we have to satisfy these three equations. Two of them are evolution equations. One we knew, one, is, uh, one we knew before, and the other one is a, is a new one that we just derived, and plus one algebraic equation at the end. Okay? Now, strictly speaking, these three equations have to be satisfied simultaneously. Okay? So, having this one satisfied simultaneously means we have to solve these three equations all lumped together in one shot. Okay? Nobody does that. Okay? The way we do that is we do it iteratively. Okay? So, we say, okay, let's back off on the simplest equation. That's the easy one. That doesn't need to be evolved. That just needs to be evaluated. Okay? That one is going to be, uh, we're going to solve this equation exactly. We're going to solve this equation exactly the way it is. And on the last one, we iterate. Okay? So exact, exact, approximate. That's how we do it. Okay? And by going around and around in an iterative scheme, we eventually solve the last one also exactly. Okay? So here is what we do. We have our governing equations. For the first time in you, we have no idea, we just guess something. If you don't have a good guess, zero is as good as anything else to start with. Okay, so we solve that equation. Then we solve the second equation, okay, for my adjoint. Okay, so we solve that equation. I'm going to show you how to get that equation in, in, a, in, a, in a minute. Okay, and then... So the Q plus that comes out of here then goes into the third equation. The HDU is this one. So the solution here that I need to evaluate that one, all these terms are from the equation. This is what just came out of the equation here. I stick that one in here, evaluate that one, and then look what we have here. The HDU. H is what we want to achieve, and U is what we want to achieve it with. So this is a gradient that we need to improve our age. Okay? This is exactly the gradient we need for the next time to do better. Okay? So this DHDU is a gradient that goes into your favorite optimization routine as the gradient. And then it tells us, okay, if you want to have a better age, go down or up the gradient. That gives you a better U, and next time around you have a better guess than you had before. You go through that cycle again until you get another gradient, and you go around and around and around and around until that gradient is going to zero, as it should. Okay? And then it says, okay, you just climbed a hill or you're down in a valley. This is your optimum. Okay? All right. Now... This was in all generality, okay? So we're no longer restricted to linear time invariant systems or Floquet systems of any kind, okay? I have not specified F. I have not said it has to be linear. We, need, we didn't need that one, okay? I didn't have to say this is autonomous in time. It can be time varying. It can be anything you want to. So at the moment, we're totally free to use F or H. So both the equation can be anything you want to, and what you're after can be anything you want to. Okay? So we can treat time periodic flows, for example, turbo machinery, blade passing, okay? pulmonary flow, hemodynamics, time varying, inlet flow, ramp up flows. Okay? You, have, you can have nonlinear flows. This F can be nonlinear. I'm going to show you an example later on where we have a nonlinear flow. Okay? Mixing. They can even be stochastic with some uncertainty thrown in. Okay? You have to formulate it a tiny little bit differently to go statistical, but nevertheless, that framework can more or less handle anything you throw at it. The optimization may be difficult, but certainly you can write down uh, in all generality what you would like to know about your fluid system. All right, so these Lagrange multipliers here, that's the new concept. Okay, so suddenly we're getting a second equation that wasn't there before. So we have to ask ourselves, was this just a math trick to get the optimization going? Or do these 
equations, this second evolution equation for the adjoint, is there something in there that we can actually use all by itself? Okay, what is, what is the role of these Lagrange multipliers? Now, the Lagrange, the, the adjoint variables, all the variables that are needed in here are independent flow fields. They have their own evolution equation. And that evolution equation looks a little bit like the Navier-Stokes equations, although not quite. Okay? And what they do is they provide sensitivity and gradient information because that, that output from the adjoint variable went straight not quite straight, but, you know, multiplied into our gradient expression at the end. So they must have something to do with a gradient, with sensitivities. Okay. So let me, let me uh, bring that home a little bit more. Okay. Let's say I have my, my cost here that I'm going to abbreviate as I, and I'm going to make a small change to my equations. Okay, so instead of Q dot minus F, Q and U, I'm going to add a little bit of a forcing term on the right hand side. Okay, that could be some bump on the wall, that could be a free stream perturbation, that could be a gust that comes by, anything you want to. But it's going to be external. Okay, so if I, of course, if I change something here, it will shake off my, my, uh, my cost functional here and the Lagrange in there as well. Okay, that's one way of doing a small perturbation. The second one, so it's an additive perturbation. The second one I can do is I can do an internal perturbation. I don't add anything to the equation on the right hand side. I mess up the terms in the equation. Okay, so my small f is actually multiplied by Q somewhere in here. I make a small change and that could be I change the Reynolds number up by a percent, okay? or I change the mean flow a little bit, or I change the Mach number, I change the geometry. I'm going to show you some examples later on. Okay? So this is an internal where I mess with the equations. This is an external where I leave the equations and add something to it. Multiplicative, additive. It doesn't matter. If you, if you cancel all the ones out here that cancel, you know, so the Q dot F cancels the I because that's how we computed it. Okay? you actually get a link between the changes you make to the effect it has on the output. Okay? So this is the change I make additively. This is the piece I add, and this is how it imp impacts my drag, for example. Okay? And you see that the proportionality between what I perturb it with and what the result is, is Q+. Plus. So it acts as the proportionality between, uh, between input and output. So the higher Q plus, the more I will mess up my drag. Okay? So if I look at the Q plus field all by itself, it immediately identifies, oh, if you do a small perturbation here, it will have a huge effect on drag. If you do it here, nobody cares, right? And where it's zero, I can do whatever I want to. It will not have any impact on the drag. Same thing here, if I change something in the, in the equation itself, that impact here, again, is multiplied by Q+, plus, but also by Q. Okay, that's the only difference. Here, it's just Q+, plus. here it's a scalar product between Q and Q+. Plus. Okay? All right. So, adjoint variables carry information by themselves. You, can, you cannot just use them for... for, for um, um, uh, optimization, it's worth looking at them all by themselves in isolation and, s and determine where in your flow do you have a sensitive area and where you don't. Okay? So, they carry information all by itself. That's very nice because with this additional information, with solving that additional, um, that additional uh, equation for the adjoint, we get an enormous amount of uh, information that we didn't have before that doesn't come out of the first equation. Okay. And because of that one, we can ask very, very different and very complicated questions that are often not asked in stability theory if you do it the classical way. The classical way, you just care about thumbs up or thumbs down. It's a binary decision. Is it stable or not? Is the eigenvalue in the half plane that is unstable or the half plane that is stable? Here we can ask a little bit more intelligent questions. For example, what are the most stability-sensitive areas in the flow? 
the adjoint will point, will point to that. Does the stability receptivity change as we change the equilibrium point, as we change the geometry, as we change a parameter? Is it getting better for higher Reynolds number or is it getting worse for higher Reynolds number? What effect does the Mach number have? All these things can be asked because we have gradient information. Okay? For another, for a standard stability analysis, you would have to do another calculation with a higher Mach number if you want to know whether it's getting better or worse for a higher Mach number. Here, we don't. And I'll show you examples where we can get actually parameter studies at almost no cost whatsoever, within reason. Okay? Also, another question that it often comes up is, is if you have an instability and you actually see the mode that grows the most, okay, where the mode grows the most is not probably where it came from. It came from somewhere else, and by the time it grew to high amplitude, it already moved away from the origin of where it started. Okay? This technique with the sensitivity actually can tell us where the origin of an instability is. Okay? Or another way of saying that one, if I want to kill that instability, where should I kill it when it's still small? Okay? Where did it come from? Where can I sort of suffocate it while it's still developing? Okay, so for control purposes, this is very, very important information. And also, of course, where should we place control elements to efficiently manipulate the flow and many, many, many more. Okay, so this is the added value that we get. We can do a much, much more complex stability analysis or flow analysis. Uh, and eigenvalues and asymptotic tools that we had based on Lapunov just cannot do that. Now, okay, before I show you some, some examples, let me also say a, a few words about the computational details. Because I just threw out that math and said, here's the adjoint equation. Well, yeah, how, how do I get that, right? How, and, and, and if I do nonlinearities, you know, is there any other things I have to watch out for? So here's a little bit of, a, of an overview of what needs to be done to do this type of analysis in the modern way like I have in the title. Okay. So this is the system we have to solve, obviously. It's that iterative round and round and round thing where you have a simulation here, and then you have to solve the adjoint equation, then you have to solve the gradient, stick it into an optimization, do better next time, and then go around and around until you have what you want. Okay. So usually what we have is something for this, this is your code, okay? And it could be open foam, or it could be your, your, your self-knitted code or something like that. It could be house code, le 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 legacy code, whatever you have, okay? So this is your code. This is what you probably don't have or probably have not even thought about, okay? And this same for this one. The optimization, I, I assume you just take uh, something off the shelf, you know, BFGS or conjugate gradient or something like that. So the question is, how do we get these components to solve this equation in the best possible way? Okay. And one possibility, there's, there's many possibilities, but one possibility is you sit down and you derive it. Okay. You take your equations and you just go through exactly that integration by parts to figure out what is this equation, this FDQ, how does that look like in my case? Now, if you have the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations for a simple geometry, that one has been done for you, okay? There's plenty of papers out, and you can even do it yourself for an afternoon, and you're, you have it done, okay? But if your F happens to be the compressible Navier-Stokes equation with reactive flows and non-equilibrium and multiphase and level sets, good luck with that one, okay? You're going to be busy for the next two years, and you better buy sheets and sheets of paper. Okay, so there has to be a little bit of a better way of getting these things from your code. Okay, now one thing, and then here is here is how we do it. Okay, so um, one possibility that often comes up that people are probably familiar with is automatic differentiation. Okay, how many of you have heard of automatic differentiation? 
Very good. Okay, so automatic differentiation is a way of getting sensitivity information, getting the adjoint by going through your code and producing from your code another code that solves the adjoint equation. Okay, and it does that automatic as the name suggests. Suggests. Okay, so typical one, Addy4 is a package. Tapinad is a, ta a package that is quite good for, for, for these things. But the problem with, uh, with automatic differentiation is you send your code that is already big, like a compressible Navier-Stokes code with shock capturing and everything, okay? And then the code that comes back after that software package works through all your subroutines is enormously inflated, okay? And also is quite slow because of that, okay? And if you look at it, what, to, to go through the code and actually learn what is it actually doing, it's a little bit like a black box, okay? So we wanted to have something that is much leaner and something that we can actually do fairly easily with our code, okay? So the FDQ, this thing here, as we know, that's the Jacobian, okay? That's the linearized Navier-Stokes equations. It's not... It's not exactly what we need, the FTQ. We need the H of that, okay, the FTQ. But let's just see, let's just go in two steps. First, I do the DFTQ, and then I say, how do, if we have that one, how do we get the transpose of it, okay? So the Jacobian is the FTQ. This matrix is generally not accessible. So we don't form that matrix. All we need is a matrix multiplication with that matrix. So I want to have, a, I'm, I'm totally happy with a routine where I give it a vector, Q, and it gives me back the vector that is multiplied by the Jacobian without ever forming the Jacobian, okay? So only matrix vector multiplication is necessary, okay? And the only assumption that I make is, and I should not even mention that, the code should be nice and modular, okay? Not just one big main code, nice subroutines that separate out the different tasks in your code. Okay. So let me demonstrate how that works, how that technique works on a very simple code example. Okay. So let's say somewhere in our code, we have the following snippet. It's a little, little code fragment. Okay. This is one time step. So we go from Q, our field right now at time step T. And this is the decuity T that we have to go into our Rungi Kuta or whatever else time stepper you have. Okay, so this is the flow field. Let's say we take an X derivative, then we go through a nonlinear subroutine F1. Whatever comes out of the air, we take the Y derivative, and then this piece and the DDX of the first piece go into a subroutine that takes two arguments and is also nonlinear, and that's our Q2, and that's the right hand side for DQ DT. Let's just say this is a little piece of our code. Could be much more complicated, okay? All right. So, like I said, I'm gonna do two steps. The, the first is the Jacobian, and then I transpose it, okay? So if you do the Jacobian, we realize that DDX, DDX is a X derivative. That's a linear operation, okay? So if I, if I, I don't need to linearize that one. It's already linear. Okay. So no linearization here. This is a nonlinear one that needs to be linearized and that needs to be linearized. But the DDX and the DDY are linear operations. Okay. I don't need to do anything about that. Okay. That's very good because we realize that the DDXs and the DDYs are the operations that link grid points together. Right? They link grid points together. I plus one, I minus one, things like that. Okay. Eno, bueno, whatever. Uh, but the nonlinearities most likely are local on the grid. Okay? They don't link the grid points together. You very seldom have a nonlinearity that actually is, is one component here and then another component from another grid point. Very, very seldom. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, for example, a reactive term is on the same grid point. Okay? So that's very good. So in order to to, uh, to, to linearize that one, we do a very simple finite difference approximation where we say F1, and we call that subroutine twice. 
ones with the part we want to linearize about and the one with a small epsilon perturbation divided by epsilon. And then this, calling it twice the same routine, <coughs> is the same as multiplying the E with the Jacobian of that subroutine. Okay? That's the trick. So by replacing this one, this routine, by a double call with a small epsilon, linearized around a Q0. And if Q0 is the same thing all the time, I can do it once and store it away. But I also can do it on the fly. Okay? I can basically replace all the nonlinear parts by their finite difference equivalent. And then my whole block diagram looks like this. Okay? So this was a nonlinear routine. By calling it twice, I linearize it. This is already linear. I linearize this one and I linearize this one. So now if I go through that part here and I patch it together like this, so the A1 is here, then the DDY is here, the A21 is here, A22 is here, you plus it, DDX of Q, then this linearized network is exactly the Jacobian. Okay? So I do automatic differentiation surgically, piece by piece that needs it and not the pieces that don't need it. Okay? So if I go through that one, I just did, instead of solving dq dt is f times q, by replacing the, the routine calls by its matrix equivalent, I just linearized my code. Okay? But the linearization is not what we want. We want the transpose of that one, right? So now, forget about this block diagram. If I transpose this expression here, okay, all together, so I slap an H on top of that one. This is what happens. I get an H on every single piece, plus I revert the order, reverse the order. Okay? That's what transposition of products does. Okay? All right. So this is really what we're after. But now, if you look at this one, you have to read it from right to left. This one basically says, first I have to do A22, then A21, then Y, then, then A1, and then the X at the end. Okay? So what that means is I have to revert the order of my block diagram. I have all these matrices, so transposing them is a piece of cake. Okay? So I just have to run through my code in reverse order and call the transpose of the matrix that I linearized. Okay? That's it. So that means that if you have a, 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 a right-hand side call that consists of calling routine one and then two and then three, for the adjoint, you have to go through and call your routine three first, then you're in, in, ad, in, in transpose uh, 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 mode, then your two and then your one. So you run through your code in reverse order with transposing every routine that you have. And that one automatically creates an adjoint time step. Okay. That's very convenient because every time I change my code, the adjoint comes with it. Okay. I add another routine. I just add another routine into my block diagram. I don't have to derive anything. I add a reactive module for, for burning gases and so on, and it gets automatically adjointed in the code. We don't derive anymore we actually take the adjoint of a code in block diagram form. Okay? And we run forward to get the forward solution, and we run through the adjoint code in reverse order to get the adjoint time stepping. So the efficiency, the linearized code and the adjoint code are approximately the same size. There is no, none of this explosion uh, with, that you get with automatic differentiation. Okay. Uh, the matrix extraction step adds only a moderate fraction. Okay. So you have to linearize on the fly. That one is usually done locally. You can store the matrix or you can, it's so cheap. You can, it's not even, you don't even bother storing it. You can actually, you know, generate it whenever you need it. Okay. It's so fast and, uh, and it works really, really well. And your adjoint is up to machine precision. You don't bother with 
boundary conditions, which usually are the killer in deriving this one, okay, everything is lumped together.